Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome again to Senior Class Chapel. Um, it's an honor to stand up here uh, one last time to talk to you from the chapel stage. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you guys for um, leading us in worship. If you have your Bibles, turn to Habakkuk chapter 3. Okay, Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. Um, it's in kind of the back half of the Old Testament. Um, I know it's kind of hard to find, so go past Psalms, past Proverbs, uh, past Daniel. If you get to Zephaniah or Zechariah, you've gone a little too far. Um, but while you're turning there, um, let me tell you that every student in this room um, is either in my current phase of life or, or will be in the next three years. Okay, what I mean by that is every student here is either beginning their last semester of college or will be someday be standing facing their last semester of undergrad and will face the question, um, what in the world am I doing? You know, like right now for us seniors, there's so many unknowns. You know, where am I going to go after graduation? What job am I going to take? Um, who's going to come with me? Where am I going to live? Um, so many unknowns that us seniors are facing right now and unknowns that um, all of us will have to face and have to answer sometime soon. And I think it's helpful in the midst of all that uncertainty to ask the simple question, um, what am I trusting in? What am I putting my hope in? Um, and what is my response when what's coming is not what I want? Okay, and those questions are not just for seniors, but they're for all of us. When I was asked to speak uh, in chapel this morning, um, a couple weeks ago, I started to think, you know, what's the sentiment on campus right now? How are people feeling? Um, and I think the sentiment right now is that a lot of people, a lot of us are excited to be back, um, but also a little bit weary of the semester ahead. Okay, we think it's going to be um, a semester that's maybe better than last semester, but um, we st or at least maybe we feel a little more prepared uh, for a semester of COVID and no breaks and that kind of thing. Um, so there's a little bit of an excitement, but at the same time, people are still getting quarantined. Uh, we still have restrictions. People are still getting sick. Uh, we don't have spring break. Uh, and it makes me wonder, what are we trusting in? What are we putting our hope in? And what will our response be when what's coming is not what we want? And the story of Habakkuk gives us some really helpful insight into how we should respond when the future is uncertain and there's major uneasiness just kind of looming around in our heads. And so uh, this morning we're going to anchor in chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. But before we get there, it's important that you understand what's happening in this story um, leading up to this passage. And so... Um, to give you some context, Habakkuk lived around the fall of Israel's southern kingdom, Judah. Okay, it was a time of violence and injustice among the people of Judah. And this book deals with the question, how do you live amid a sinful and broken world? Okay, and so Habakkuk, he's a prophet and he's um, a prophet to these wicked people. But unlike a lot of the other prophets we see, um, this book, Habakkuk isn't taking God's word to the people. Rather, it's a conversation back and forth between Habakkuk and God, just the two of them. Okay, and so um, in chapter one, Habakkuk cries out to God about how sinful and wicked God's people have become and asks God why he lets this kind of thing go on. God answers Habakkuk and assures him that he knows about um, the sin and the wickedness of Judah and that he's going to send the Babylonians to come and judge Judah and drag them away into exile. And as you can imagine, uh, this doesn't fly super well with Habakkuk. He, he replies, he's like, what, God, how can, you, how can you do that? I mean, those people are worse than we are. How can you bring people who treat others like animals and they've kind of deified their power in the world? How can you use those terrible people to judge us? And so God tells Habakkuk, take some tablets and, and write on them this, a vision that God's going to show him. And so Habakkuk gets out his tablets and God shows him this vision of what we call the five woes or five characteristics of wicked nations that God will punish. And these woes include things like unfair economic practices, slave labor, and um, ultimately nations who practice idolatry. God promises to punish um, Babylon and other nations like this. And so God tells Habakkuk that um, the time will ultimately come where, where God will punish Babylon, but first he's going to use them to uh, punish Judah. 
And God tells Habakkuk that in chapter two, verse four, that the righteous shall live by faith in this promise, that God will keep his promise to enact justice, punish the wicked, um, and ultimately restore Israel. Okay, and so that's chapter two. And then as we get to chapter three, chapter three is a prayer by Habakkuk, um, just highlighting God's mighty power and, and how he's demonstrated this faithfulness by keeping the same promise in the past to destroy corrupt nations and to serve them justice. Okay, Habakkuk, and so that's kind of the this, this situation. Uh, God says the Babylonians are coming and Habakkuk's like, okay, uh, you've been faithful in the past. Um, he says this in verse 16, I hear, so here's the promise. He hears what God is saying. And my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Okay, so he trusts the Lord. And right now, that as terrified as he is, he's trusting the Lord and waiting for the day that God will punish Babylon. Okay, and so that's the context we're walking into this morning. God has told Habakkuk that his country is going to be soon overtaken by a terribly wicked people and driven into captivity. Um, but he's also promised that, that God is in control. That God knows exactly what he's doing and that the God of justice is on his throne despite uh, everything that Habakkuk can see right in front of him. Okay, and so then verse 17 and 19, that's where we're going to be this morning spending most of our time. Um, let's look at what Habakkuk's response to all this uncertainty um, of ha ahead of him. So it says this, verse 17, look at it. It says, though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. To the choir master with the stringed instruments. Okay, so do you see Habakkuk's response? In the midst of terrifying uncertainty about so much unknown, Habakkuk is resolute to trust the Lord and rejoice in his goodness. And notice that he's not timid in this response either. You know, he's, 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 he's definitive, he's sure, and he's confident that he will rejoice and he will respond by, re uh, yeah, he will respond by trusting the Lord and then rejoicing in him. And so again, that's gonna be our focus today, Habakkuk's response to God. And I think it's gonna be very beneficial to us um, to see what God says here, because have you ever felt this way before? I mean, felt like the world is falling apart a little bit? Have you ever, you know, looked around and, and wondered what in the world God is doing? Have you ever looked forward and thought, man, I have no clue uh, what's next or how to get there? Heck, I don't even know what direction I'm walking in right now. What Habakkuk teaches us here is that um, we don't need all the answers and neither does God owe them to us. Our job is to rejoice. That's our job, to rejoice in the Lord, to take joy in the God of your salvation because he is good and sovereign and he knows way better than you do or I do. So that's what we're gonna be talking about this morning. So let's look back at the passage again. Uh, verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines. The produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Okay, so the main idea this morning um, is this, rejoice in our faithful God, okay? That's it, rejoice in our faithful God. So let me, let me first point out that what Habakkuk's describing here is a really bad thing. Um, in this day and age, if these things didn't happen, um, that'd be very, very bad news for the people. I mean, this is their livelihood and their sustenance for staying alive. And so Habakkuk isn't talking here about simple, unfortunate or um, inconvenient things. He's going very far and saying that even if everything fails and I'm on um, the verge of starvation, still I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You know, he's not messing around here and it begs the question, how can he rejoice and take joy? Right, like how can this guy who's just heard that one of, one of the most 
uh, wicked nations in the world is coming to likely take himself and the rest of his people away into captivity, how can he rejoice and take joy in God? I think what the passage makes obvious here is that Habakkuk can rejoice because he knows uh, the character of this God, of his God. He knows that the God he's speaking to and he knows that his character is not one to forget his promises or to act unjustly. Habakkuk just spent all of chapter three marveling at the might and the majesty of God, saying things like, the mountains saw you and they writhed in verse 10. And he said in verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Okay, so in these passages, he's remembering how God has delivered his people um, out of Egypt and led them to the promised land. That's what he's kind of referring to. And as you know, uh, God promised the land of Canaan to Abraham in Genesis 15, but Jacob's family left the land to go to Egypt, right? The story of Joseph. So here the Egyptian, the Israelites were in Egypt and the Egyptians enslaved them, but God did not forget his promise that he made to Abraham. God used Moses, you know, hundreds of years later to deliver his people from slavery and he destroyed a wicked nation in the process. This is the God that Habakkuk is speaking to. Habakkuk finds God worthy of his trust and as a result, chooses to rejoice. And it makes me wonder, and let me ask you the question, do you know the character of this God? If you continue to find yourself anxious and worried about the future may hold or what God is doing or or maybe what God isn't doing, maybe we need to ask ourselves, do we really know the character of God? Maybe you need to take some time in God's word and find out who God really is. I mean, how often do we say when we're facing something that we don't know um, is coming, like, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm trusting God in the process or I'm trusting God in this. And that's good and that's something we're commanded to do, but how often do we say that, but that trust does nothing to, to change how we think about the situation? I mean, we're just as anxious and just as worried as ever. Seniors, how does this play out when you're looking for what's next? When you have to decide where on earth you're gonna live, does this trust actually change the way you think about the future? Does not knowing these major details of your life, as important as they are, does it lead you to rejoicing in a God who already has it figured out and knows exactly what he's doing? I think you'll find that, that knowing, learning and knowing the character and the supremacy of God goes a long way in dispelling worry about the future and brings an incredible and uncontrollable joy. Habakkuk here has seen God be faithful in the past and so he rejoices in the present. He trusts God and it leads him to rejoice. God's faithful, he's been faithful, his character is to be faithful and so why would he ever stop being faithful? Does your trust in God lead you to rejoicing? When you realize that you really aren't in control of what goes on, but God is, does that lift the burden off of you and lead you to joy and worship? Knowing God's character is enough for Habakkuk to take joy and rejoice. This is the God of his salvation, his rescuer and his sustainer. God is Habakkuk's strength, which allows him to have a hope that is greater than what's on the horizon. And so he can say that even if nothing goes right, even if we lose all of our wealth and the Babylonians come, they take us away and we have nothing, still I will rejoice. What if that was the anthem of our lives? What if we could say the same thing? You know, what, if, what if this semester isn't any better than last semester? What if America as we know it continues to kind of fall apart all around us? Um, seniors, what if you can't find a job? What if you don't meet someone in college that you want to spend the rest of your life with? What if you don't get into grad school? What if your internship gets canceled again this summer? What if this year is just as hard and just as confusing as last year? What if we still can't put a finger on what God is doing in us and in the world around us? What will your response be? Though all these things may happen, may we be a people who say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will take joy in the God of my salvation. If these questions or questions like them are racing around in your head, I would ask you again, what are you putting your trust in? And what are you putting your hope in? What do my actions, what do your actions, your worries or and your thoughts, what do they reveal about where you're putting your security? You know, we would never say that I'm putting my hope in finding a job or I'm, I'm putting my hope in the political climate around us, but um, let's take a step back and think more carefully and ask ourselves, am I really, am I really trusting God? Do these questions, as important as they are, lead me to worship God even if nothing works out the way I want or the way that I have it planned? I will genuinely rejoice because I know that God's ways are higher and better than my own. Where are you putting your trust in now? Are we remembering the character of our God and rejoicing in his sovereign goodness? Habakkuk's hope is in God and we can put our hope in the exact same God. Okay, and so all that's sweet, all that's cool, all that's exciting, um, but there's more to the story. Okay, we're not Habakkuk, um, and nor are we standing at the same point in history that Habakkuk was standing. We know more of the story, and that gives us even more of a reason to trust the Lord, rejoice in God, and have hope in a brighter future. Okay, um, have you ever been in a situation where you're really excited for something, uh, you knew whatever it was, it was going to be really good. Uh, but then when you get there or some time goes on, you learn more information, and uh, it's even better than you expected. This happened with, for me and my friends last spring break. Uh, we were trying to decide where we were gonna go, uh, if we were gonna go to a friend's house in Florida or a friend's house in Texas, and we were kind of going back and forth, um, sort of leaning towards Florida, which is good. Um, we we're all excited about it. You know, it was gonna be warm, the beach was there. Um, it was all good, you know, we were pumped. Um, then one day, uh, we were sitting in the Bills parking lot, and our friend who lives in Florida, whose house we were going to, um, turns around, and he's like, oh, by the way, uh, my uncle works at Disney World and can get us all in for free. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> you know? And so we, we all looked at each other, and we're like, are you kidding me? Like, you didn't think to lead with that? Like, that's the most important part of this whole situation. And, you know, being the Disney fan that we all are, um, we were shocked that not only are we going to the beach and not only do we get to go to the warm weather, but we also get to go to Disney for free. Um, like, that's sweet. And so we learn more information, learn more of the story, and it made a very good thing even better and gave us even more of a reason to be excited for this trip. Okay, and so this is a similar situation that we find ourselves in when we look at this response by Habakkuk. Um, but on a much greater scale, as you can imagine, better than Disney. Uh, you could argue that it's potentially easier for us to trust God and rejoice in him because we know more of how God's story has played out and his plan for the future. Okay, so what's so sweet about this passage is that um, Habakkuk trusted the Lord, not knowing anything good was about to come. He's at a position where he's standing and he's looking out and seeing terrible things that are promised to come and um, he's choosing to set his joy in the hope that God will fulfill his promise. All he had was his trust that God is faithful and that God will save his people and someday, someday God will punish Babylon. And so you could say that we're in a similar situation Habakkuk was in. We're surrounded by evil and uncertainty in this world. We don't know what tomorrow holds or what God will allow to take place, but we have a promise that we can put our hope into. Our God has promised that he will come back for his people and bring us home to spend eternity with him. He's already won the victory over evil and we can live our lives trusting in that truth. God has been faithful in the past and so we can trust that he will be faithful in the present and faithful in the future. We know so much more of the story. Not only do we know that God did punish the Babylonians, he did punish them and he was faithful to this specific promise that we see here in Habakkuk 3, but we also know uh, more about what he has done, what he's continuing to do, and what he will eventually do when he brings us home. Um, flip over, if you will, to Titus chapter 3. Okay, I think this is going to help make this point um, Titus 3, verse 3, says this, 3 to 7. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, 
led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. And here it is, verse seven. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, so there's a promise and a hope that you and I can look forward to and rejoice because of. Okay, because ultimately, ultimately what we know is that the sin that caused the wickedness in Babylon um, that God promised to judge is the same sin that is in every single one of us and that God still must punish that sin. That before a holy God, you and I must give an answer for that sin that we have committed and the penalty for that sin is death and eternal separation from God in hell. And there's nothing we can do about it on our own. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, sent Jesus, his own son into the world to live a perfect life, a life that we could not live, a life free from sin and so undeserving of the penalty for that sin but in his love and his grace stepped into your place and took the punishment that you and I deserve. And he hung on a cross and he died bearing all the weight of God's wrath. A perfect sacrifice, undeserving of death, but worthy to be our substitute. And, but in doing so, he took sin to the grave and he conquered it. Sin could not keep him down. The chains of death could not keep the God of life constrained. And he rose again, defeating death and giving sin, uh, defeating sin and death and giving you and me an opportunity to be welcomed into his family and united with him. And not only this, but we are given a hope for eternal life. Blessings in this life and blessings to come. To be in the presence of God perfectly forever is what's waiting for us. Just like Habakkuk could rejoice because of the hope he had in God, we can rejoice because we have a hope secured in heaven forever. A living hope purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The gospel gives us incredible hope, an incredible hope that we can rejoice in even when everything else seems to be falling apart. This hope is now and it's ours now because our salvation uh, is sealed by the blood of Christ. This is a hope that is sure and is current. Okay, we are awaiting a day when God will fulfill another promise and that promise is to take us home with him for eternity. And and do you wanna know, do you wanna know what this place is like, what this promise is like that we can eagerly wait for? The Bible says this, Revelation 21, uh, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Doesn't this excite you? Like, doesn't this make you long for this place? Doesn't this create in you this feeling of like, I don't wanna be here anymore. Like, I don't belong here. Like, take me there. I want to go there. You know, this is a place that where plans aren't foiled, where pain is gone, where uncertainty is no more. A place where everything is how it should be and, and the whole history of time has finally arrived at where it was created to end up. Like, think about that. Let the gospel create in you a longing for that place, but also an immense excitement right now. Let's get excited about the truth of the gospel and what that means for us. Habakkuk was trusting that God would crush evil enemies. We know that Christ has defeated death itself. We know that Satan's greatest weapon has been dismantled and that one day God will crush the head of Satan once and for all and win the victory for all of us. We have an ending to that story that is way beyond our wildest imagination, and I believe way beyond what Habakkuk was thinking in this passage. Habakkuk's trust in the same powerful, promise-keeping, victorious God is why we can say that even though 
The fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines. The produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And this same powerful, promise-keeping, victorious God is why we can say it with him. This is instruction for us on how to live in the meantime. We are to live rejoicing and with a joy, knowing that God is our strength and our salvation. How sweet is that? We're literally commanded by God to rejoice and have joy. We are looking out and awaiting for God to fulfill his promise and prove faithful yet again. We have a hope purchased for us and that proves that God is on our side and in control. If God is taking care of your biggest problem, if he has done what you could not do on your own by taking your sin away and adopting you into his family to spend eternity with him, don't you think that he'll, he will take care of the smaller problems that you're facing? Don't you think that he's still near and still patient and still working? So don't be anxious, don't worry, but rejoice in a God who does not waste his time but is is working and is faithful to bring about good and accomplish his perfect purposes. So what what are you trusting in? What are you putting your hope in? What is your response when what's coming is not what you want? Do you or will you respond with resolute trust in a faithful God that he will protect and provide for his people. To close this morning, I have a few actions, um, items that I think will help us trust God more and rejoice in his goodness. Okay, number one, rehearse the gospel every day. The gospel is the ultimate reason why we can have joy in the first place. You know, our biggest problem has been taken care of and our hard hearts need reminded of that every single day. Remember the beauty of the gospel and let it excite you and bring you joy. Number two, remember God's promises and remember how he's been faithful to you. Okay, make a list this today or, or make a list this weekend of 10 ways God has been faithful in your life. How have you personally seen God keep his promises? How have you seen God's character demonstrated in your life? What are 10 things that have happened to you or happened that that only God could do? And then share that with somebody. Tell someone. Number three, thank God for the hope of eternity that is purchased and sealed for us because of the blood of the lamb. If you're a believer, your future is secure. You can bank on spending eternity in perfect fellowship with God in heaven. And that is a reality a reality that gives us hope and another reason why we can take joy no matter what may happen on this earth. And number four, be excited. I mean, our walk with the Lord is not boring. Your salvation and my salvation is remarkable because Christ has come and given his own life for you. He didn't just come, rise again, and and then leave us on our own, but instead he did all those things as undeserving as we are of those but then went further and and left his spirit to dwell in the hearts of believers. He is near and he is kind and he blesses our obedience. He has provided you and I with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And every day, we are one day closer to going home with him forever. I mean, that's something to be excited about. And we should be excited. So let us rejoice in the Lord. No matter what may come or no matter what is taken away, let us rejoice in the God of our salvation. Rejoice in our faithful God. Trust in him, put your hope in him and respond with joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for uh, your goodness. God, thank you for your kindness. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and that you provide for your people. God, you have proven faithful Um, throughout history, God, and we can trust that you're faithful again. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. 
Lord, and that we have a hope that is secured and that is coming for us. Father, because of the blood of the lamb, we will spend eternity with you if we trust in that lamb. So Father, help us to see our circumstances in light of eternity, God, that you have taken care of our sin and so now we can rejoice. We can trust that you'll take care of everything else, God, and we can have joy as we're commanded to um, because of what you've, done, what you've done and who you are. Um, Father, we need you. God, we love you. Help us to love you more and, and know the gospel more. Create in us a hope to be excited for. You're going to pray. Amen.